Hello all and welcome to another Q&A Monday session, the second session now of hopefully what will be a long series. Um, so I'm going to be answering some more questions that have been posed in the, in the meantime since the last video. Uh, and the first one, I'll just get straight into it. The first one is from John Burnham. And he'd said, I'd like to know if music is something that you do for a living or is it a serious hobby to, hobby to you? So is music something I do for a living or is it just a hobby? Um, well, it's, it's a living because I, I'm, I'm teaching and I do offer, I have done some session work here and there. Um, so it's a living in that respect. I, of course, I'd love to do even more session work but we'll see what happens with that. Um, but I mean, obviously I, I do this for a living, but also I do it because I love music. So it's, I guess it's a hobby as well as, uh, um, as, well as a job. Um, that was probably quite a boring answer. Uh, okay, so the next question I've got is uh, from Insomniac Folder. And the question is, in your original music, you seem to like exploring non-standard time signatures and mixed time signatures. Why is that? What do they offer to you? It's a lot of questions. Uh, and what advice do you have for musicians looking to similarly explore beyond two, three, four, you know, six and stuff? <laughs> I didn't read that probably, but you get the idea. Um, so, okay. Um, for me, the, the whole reason my music my, my original music is probably nowhere near as uh, mainstream or nowhere near as accessible is because I, I do love that kind of um, awkward jarring type music. I do like, um, I like to uh, hear stuff that isn't, isn't instantly easy to figure out. So I, so I kind of, I like writing stuff that is a bit weird, maybe just a bit, it's not, I don't think it's totally, it's certainly not sort of out there, like, you know, sort of Alan Holdsworth. If you don't know Alan Holdsworth, look him up. He's just, well, he, he unfortunately, he's uh, no longer with us, but he uh, was a phenomenal guitar player and musician. And um, I, of course, love his kind of music, although I couldn't write that kind of stuff. That's just beyond me, to be honest, it's beyond me. Um, it's just phenomenal stuff. Um, Another uh, influence would be Virgil Donati, a, an Australian drummer who is just an incredible drummer, an incredible musician though as well. He's, he's a, um, also plays piano, also plays guitar I think as well, uh, but you know, he's just a phenomenal musician and um, they influence, um, I listen to their stuff as well, you see. So obviously I'm trying to come, I'm trying to write stuff that um, is more challenging, but at the same time, it's kind of accessible at times as well. So it's not kind of, it's not that far out there. Um, so, okay, so jarring music I enjoy. I like stuff that's not kind of too easy on the ear. Um, and I like stuff, yeah, just to be a bit more challenging, just to be a bit more, not as predictable. Not, you know, because with a lot of music, um, I guess mainstream music, you kind of know what's coming. You, you, you can predict most things. You sort of know where it's going to go roughly next, and and so I, I just enjoy something a bit challenging at times. Um, not to say I don't love a lot of uh, well, from my channel you can see I like like lots of music that wouldn't be considered progressive or you know sort of um, unusual. Um, so I hope that helps a bit. I hope it answered. Um, this is a question now from Mark Stanton. Um, and he's asking, what sort of recording setup do you use to record your tracks and videos? Uh, and then the second question is, what are your thoughts on amp modeling um, software such as Guitar Rig versus the Kemper? Um, I didn't read that question properly, but, um, so I'll start with um, the first bit, that'd be helpful. What sort of recording setup do you record your tracks with? Okay, so on this, the, the, the way I record this and the way I record the music as well would be um, I'm using a Universal Audio Apollo, um, which is my interface. The Kemper profile is going straight through that. And this, this is all on PC as well. This is not on, on a Mac or anything. Um, and then it's going into Pro Tools. And that's as simple as it gets, really. Just as simple as that. Um, the Kemper is, as I've talked to you before, I'll probably talk about this every video, I reckon. It's one of my favorite sort of 
things I've ever bought because it makes recording easy. It makes, uh, it, when you find the sound you like, you just save it and it's there. It doesn't sound, uh, it can sound almost exactly like an amplifier. So it's not modeling as such. Um, with amp modeling, I'm not, guitar rig and such, such, such I've not played that. I, I don't know what that's really like, so I, I can't really comment on that. I'd say that these days, things are getting so good um, that you can buy stuff that isn't gonna sort of break the bank and you'll still sound really good. I think it sounds really, really good, some of the stuff that's out there. Um, I don't know enough about it because, I, because I've got the Kemper and I'm really happy with that, I tend to just kind of, that's, that's me done then. I don't tend to look at too much else. Um, so I would certainly say that these days, compared to maybe you know, 10, 20 years ago, things are pretty amazing, really, for the, for the money as well. Um, technology just keeps moving, obviously. Uh, but I would certainly, at the same time, I would say that I'm very happy with the Kemper, and I would really recommend them. I think they're phenomenal things. Um, and then you've got, of course, then you've got like the forums in the Kemper um, world where people exchange rigs, they exchange like the profiles they use. Um, you can obviously buy profiles that are made professionally by, by companies, something like the Amp, the Amp Factory, um, a great company who make um, profiles for the Kemper. I'll put a link to those in the description. Um, yeah, so I hope that helped a bit. Uh, the next question is from Richard Moore. Um, no relation to Gary or Vinny, presumably. Uh, and he says, hi Dave, I've been playing for 20 years and I find I always end up playing the pretty similar sounding pentatonic phrases or solos when I improvise. What techniques do you find most useful to try to add, God, I can't read. What techniques do you find most useful when trying to add something different to a song? Modes, etc. cetera. Um, and, okay, so th this is a tough one because after 20 years, um, I'd be, well, I'd be saying the same thing. I'd be saying, you know, I I sometimes feel I play the same sort of licks here and there. Um, I think that just happens to anyone, really. Um, I guess the most important thing, <coughs> if you have time, is to just try and, I guess, listen to lots and lots of different players, especially from different genres, and try and take something from that genre and then put it into the genre you're playing. And I find that that way you come across sort of more interesting ideas because you're, you're playing something that's maybe not meant to be necessarily from the rock genre or from the jazz or whatever. And you put it into the rock genre. For, uh, for, this is from my point of view. If you take something from a jazz kind of perspective, put it into the rock genre, it kind of gives it a different um, sound. Okay, so after a coughing fit, um, I was trying to do, uh, Say that yeah. So if you take if you're taking sort of um, licks and things from uh, different genres, and then trying to incorporate them into your into your own playing, I mean that can to me that's a really great way of um, getting rid of some of the the more tired things that you might sort of think oh I've played that before I play. I mean this I'm doing this all the time. I'm constantly looking at my playing and going oh god I've probably played that lick or something very very similar to it you know a few times before today. Um, so modes and stuff, I never think in mode terms. I never think, I, um, I would say I'm going from a sort of basis of knowing the shapes of the pentatonics, let's say, um, and then you're just adding in additional notes or, or adding in passing tones. So, so basically the wrong, you know, effectively it's the wrong notes. You're adding in the wrong notes, but you're doing them quite quickly and landing on a good note, as it were. Um, and then it sounds like, you know, it sounds like, oh, that's quite cool. Um, but yeah, you're just hitting wrong notes, but trying to get them in amongst a, a sort of a lick that maybe you already know. So that's, that's something I'd sort of try and approach it from that direction. So you, you take something you already know, and then maybe you approach it from a note below uh, where you would normally start, slide into something like that. And then maybe, you know, if you're doing a little sort of uh, something like a look down the scale, you just kind of add in some extra passing notes on the way. Um, that'd be a quick way to get into that kind of thing, I guess. Um, but knowing, knowing sort of your positions of the pentatonics and stuff, I find it's just, it's, it's gonna really help a lot. It helps you be a bit more sort of free flowing and sort of moving around the neck um, in not, hopefully not too predictable way. Uh, anyway, I hope that helps. Um, and my last question in this video is gonna be from David Edwards. Um, and he says, the question is, when playing, do you think in terms of scale shapes, 
i.e. have you spent many hours learning these shapes and joining them together? Uh, it's almost as if I should have read that question first, isn't it? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I do. I, I guess I do think in scale shapes, but I try and break them up uh, when I'm playing. So, um, if I was teaching this to somebody, I would probably say, obviously it's important to know your scale shapes, you know, kind of the pentatonics, you know, the, the way that it's sort of written on the, on, the, on the scale sheets that you can find everywhere. But what I would say is that maybe practice them also sort of starting at one scale, sliding into, um, sort of halfway through, sliding to another scale shape. Then maybe, you know, again, go up a few notes, slide into another shape. Keep doing things like that in no particular order so that after a while your hand just kind of knows roughly where you're going to slide into next, okay? So to me, that gives you a more fluent sort of uh, approach. So you're not thinking, oh, I, I go down this scale here and then I move it up here and that kind of thing. You're thinking more like, actually, I'll move halfway through and then I'll kind of slide it up again, move halfway, go across somewhere else. I find that really works for me. I try and encourage sort of students that I teach that kind of uh, approach to, to give, so they're not kind of ending up um, being boxed in. Like they'll, they'll learn the, the scale shapes and then they'll just be boxed in instantly. So it's, it's, a, real, it's a real pain to be like that. So um, I would say, yeah, try to approach every scale shape. Um, you know, obviously kind of learn them to a point a bit like a parrot, you know, just kind of learn them this way and then start trying to break them up, sliding between them, breaking them up in no particular order. So you don't want to go up four notes, up four notes, up four notes. You want to kind of go up four notes, uh, then maybe slide it, then go up five notes, slide back, something like that. That kind of thing. It gets your hand used to roughly where you're going. Um, and then the great thing is with guitars, then you can just transfer that in any key because it's really just about the sort of shapes and uh, distances that you're kind of learning there. Um, so I hope that helped a little bit. I hope that was some kind of insight into, um, into what I do, or how I'd approach it at least. And there's so many ways of approaching things, and I would never say just listen to one person. I'd always say listen to other people, take their opinions as well, because I think there's so many great players out there, much better than me kind of thing, and, and they've got some great advice. Um, anyway, um, hope you've enjoyed today and I will uh, be sure to do another one next week. So if there's any more questions, comments, things like that, please leave them in the uh, comment section. And uh, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will catch you all next time.